Meanwhile, I mentioned the Southern District. A former U.S. attorney there, Assistant U.S. Attorney Dana Perry, says it's a clear indication they're close, very close, to indicting him, executing the search warrant, is almost the last step in the playbook. A quote from someone who knows their way around these probes, and with us is that, Dania Perry, uh, here to give us insights into the legal process. Michael Steele, the former RNC chair who endorsed Joe Biden. And Olivia Nuzzi, Washington correspondent for New York Magazine. You may recall some of her coverage of Rudy Giuliani that was interesting, largely because of the way Giuliani rolls. Her story, a reporter's guide to texting with Rudy Giuliani, was chock full of nuggets that remain in the news cycle evergreen. Uh, good to have all of you here. Uh, I gave a little legal summary, and we'll get to more of the law, but Michael, I want to begin with you big picture. What does it mean, even in a time where everyone's gotten used to everything, um, that the former president sees a second top attorney of his indicted by the Southern, excuse me, uh, raided by the Southern District, the previous one indicted, uh, and what does this tell us um, about the hangover from that Trump era? Well, it's not a good day in the neighborhood uh, if you're in the Giuliani neighborhood or in the Trump neighborhood because it means that there are federal investigations that are out there and we don't even know. It's it's a lot like very good reporters when they put out the first story about something and it like blows up and everybody's like, oh my God, you know there's a second and possibly a third or fourth story coming along. Same is true in this situation with, with federal indictments. When there's the hint that there's something going on when there's a raid or an investigation. That doesn't happen, especially when it requires a judge to sign off on it. Um, It doesn't happen unless you have all those dots uh, dotted and those uh, T's crossed uh, in a way that um, puts some cement to what you're doing. And I think that should be very concerning for for, uh, Rudy and for Trump. But here's the rub. On the Trump end of it, he's just like, Rudy? Rudy who? You know, I really don't know the guy. You know, we met on occasions, uh, but I'm not that familiar. What does he do again? So expect that to come at some point if the heat comes up on this, where Trump creates that sort of Heisman move that he's noted for in creating distance between him and the individual who's suspect number one, two, or 20. Uh, And and Rudy then has to figure out how he navigates this this space, Um, you know, there, there are a lot of stories out there about just how sort of thin this relationship is between Rudy and, and Donald Trump in the first place. Um, so we'll see whether or not that has an effect as this investigation unfolds. And, Anya, you look at the situation, uh, as Michael mentions, just for reporting the news, if any former uh, lawyer to the recent president um, has their home and office raided, it's a huge story. Uh, If this happened to former President Obama and his top lawyer, particularly overlapping with a time when he was the lawyer to the sitting president, we would be reporting that. It's a big deal. It it hasn't happened, though, recently to other presidents. It's happened now twice to Donald Trump. Based on your knowledge of SDNY, and and we quoted you earlier, where do you see a raid uh, like this figuring into an open probe? Well, as you say, it's highly unusual. Um, Raids on lawyers' offices are unusual in the first instance. Um, I've seen it done a couple times, both on the defense side. I represented um, Michael Cohen, who I know will be on later, um, and uh, Michael Avenatti, both of whom had um, their offices raided. And there's a lot of steps in in the process. I was on the other side for many years at the U.S. Attorney's Office. I had to sign off on these kinds of warrants. And, you know, the U.S. Attorney has to sign off, the Assistant Attorney General, the Deputy, And these ones almost assuredly went up to the level of the attorney general. So it's a very big deal. Typically, the standard is probable cause. In this case, there was no doubt a much higher standard that was in fact applied. I don't know if it rises to beyond a reasonable doubt, but these uh, these lawyers at the U.S. Attorney's Office have been waiting a long time. They've run through all the paces. They have this lockdown. So um, they are feeling very confident about this. Let's let's drill on your point there, just to be clear. In a standard situation, probable cause, low medium standard that there's evidence of the crime in the in the place being searched, specific articulable facts. You're saying that because it's a lawyer, let alone a lawyer to the president, and it goes all the way up to that main justice clearance, it is as a in fact practically a much higher standard, which means it's worse for Giuliani. I think so. I mean, it's not just because he's a lawyer, not just because 
He's the former president's former lawyer. But also, this is obviously a high-profile case. The stakes are high. There are some built-in defenses. Um, there are political defenses. Um, there's going to be a lot at stake here. And so I think for all those reasons that they will have gone the extra mile, no doubt they have uh, executed additional search warrants before they got to this point. Um, they have, yeah. as Michael said, dotted all their I's and crossed all their T's. So I think they're, I, I would be shocked if they couldn't indict right now. There's clearly a grand jury that's already impaneled. Um, of course, they're going to, this was a belt and suspenders. Um, they're going to go through the evidence. So it you could take some. Let me, I'm only, I'm only slowing you down because you're such a smart, fast lawyer. You're moving fast on me. So, you know, I'm just a country <laughs> television lawyer. As a former assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District, you're saying, based on your knowledge of the way these things work, that right now your understanding, your premise would be that they already have enough to indict Mr. Giuliani now. I would say that with a high degree of confidence. I'm generally pretty risk averse, but I would bet a lot of money on that. Um, so the timing, uh, I would say, is unclear just because they are going to want to go through this. They're going to have what's called the taint team to go through it. And um, they, they will take as much time as they have. They don't have any political pressures anymore. Um, so they will go through all of the steps and they will make sure, as I said, that it's completely buttoned wow. down. But I, I, I think it's, it's highly likely that they know already that this is an indictable offense. That's fascinating. I mean, Michael, as, as Elliot Ness used to say, whoop, there it is. I mean, this is a prosecutor saying she thinks they have the goods. I mean, look, anything can happen, of course, but they've been sitting on this I'm for sorry, a I'm sorry, I'm going to Mike. Let, let me, I'm sorry. So I'm bringing Michael in if you can hear me, and then we'll go back to you. Yeah, no, I, I, I was just saying those words were about to trip off my tongue. Whoop, there it is. She just laid it out. And, and the reality, that's the new, new reality uh, for uh, Trump and, and those who have been in that orbit around these very controversial matters. And, and to the point about what the president himself, Joe Biden, uh, has said, said in the interview that I didn't know about this until you'd learned about it. I think that's the kind of wall that the American people want to see rebuilt uh, between the executive branch uh, and those uh, branches that deal with law enforcement, et cetera, like the FBI, like the Department of Justice, so that we can look at these uh, events as they occur, as these reports are, are rolled out, and certainly as these investigations unfold with clean hands and clean eyes. Uh, and, and appreciate uh, the work that's being done here, that it's not somehow tainted, that there is not some backroom deal trying to CYA a Rudy Giuliani or the president himself. And, and I think that's a good thing right now. Olivia? Hi. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I think that this is obviously uh, a bad week for Rudy Giuliani, but one that he would have to have seen coming. I mean, he knew the reports uh, were out there for several years now that investigators were interested in him, interested in his business associates. He talked to me about it. Uh, he seemed rather uh, bitter and almost hurt in a way that anyone in law enforcement, people that he considers to be you know, his guys, that's his community of people in his mind, uh, that he would become a target. It, there's sort of a, a tragic element to that. Um, but it, it's not surprising. And in some ways, it's almost as though he's been tempting investigators. Uh, his behavior has gotten more and more insane. Um, he's been out in the open uh, talking about meddling in, in different things for years now. And all on behalf of someone who, as Michael alluded to earlier, it's not like they've got a deep friendship, him and Donald Trump. Donald Trump does not have deep friendships. He has people that he's known a long time. Uh, he has people who have done him favors repeatedly. He has people who have displayed uh, loyalty to him for a long time, like Rudy Giuliani. But he does not have, you know, a deep soul connection with other human beings the way that, um, you know, normal people might. So it, it's not as though these are, are guys who go back to grade school and they, they swore some kind of oath to each other. Uh, Rudy has been using Donald Trump for relevance and, and probably for profit. Uh, for the duration of his political career, certainly. And uh, Donald Trump has been using him sort of as an excuse and as someone to kind of take the arrows as they come at him. Um, but if I were Donald Trump, I would 
be hearing footsteps right now. It's as though investigators for years, whether it's Robert Mueller, uh, whether it's federal investigators now, have been getting closer and closer to the former president himself. Mm. All great points. And as you say, if it's purely a transactional relationship in the exchange of fame and clout uh, and other attempts to uh, self-aggrandize, then when the terms of the transaction change, people go a different direction. Um, Eagle-eyed viewers can see, and it was mentioned, we have Mr. Cohen coming up on the program, um, who really has unique personal insights into exactly that, that trade-off. Uh, Ms. Perry, also take a listen to how Rudy sounded uh, on the radio here, just briefly discussing this. And what have they done? What have they done? Nothing except come after me with a you know, at 6 o'clock in the morning with a piece of nonsense. No wonder they're jealous. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Uh, as, as Olivia mentioned, it overlaps a little bit with some of her earlier reporting where he was bad-mouthing the Southern District, where he, of course, used to run the office. Uh, it is a highly unusual situation. But, Ms. Perry, what do you think of both that general, the general way he's talking about it, as well as... Uh, his more specific claim that this all boils down to only a lobbying filing issue and no other wider set of potential allegations or crimes. Well, the first thing I, I do agree with Olivia, I think um, he's got to have a, a sense of betrayal and shock, even though, as you said, Olivia, this has been a long time in coming. It's a very clubby network, the Southern District of New York. Um, I remember going to the 225th anniversary party a couple of years ago. Um, just a few years ago, Rudy was invited, but he was on the golf course, so he didn't attend. But almost everyone else who'd ever been, um, you know, in those uh, courtrooms and uh, in those hallways attended. And um, so I think, you know, he sees himself as part of the club, and he's surprised this has turned on him. Um, you know, the, the notion that um, they're, they're jealous, these uh, agents who are executing the search warrant at 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, that's that's a non sequitur and nonsense, of course. But um, I think he is dismissive because he probably thinks, you know, I, I think he said in other reporting that he tried to make this right, he reached out. That's not the way it works. Uh, if there's a criminal violation here, if he failed to register and if he was, in fact, lobbying and uh, if it was, in fact, on behalf of a foreign agent, that's a crime. And there's really no getting around it, no matter what club he's in. So, um, you know, he's very soon yeah. going to be happy to facing the music. Yeah. Uh, and you made some really important points that I want to thank Ms. Perry and Ms. Newsy both on this big Giuliani story. Michael Steele stays um, as we await.